Thank you for coming. We may have more people come in in the next couple minutes, but um, I'm Leah Jones. I'm a parent in Montpelier. I have three kids in the schools, and I'm part of the Union School Parents Group, which in Main Street Parents Group, which is sponsoring this event. And we're really excited about it. Um, we have a lot of people express interest, so clearly there's a need for this. Um, and I want to hand it over to Ben right away so he can get going. And, and so you don't have to keep talking. Yes, yeah, so I can sit down. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. So yeah, thank you all for coming out. I have not done this with a, with a handheld mic before, so I'm gonna be prone to that. So I'll try to do this, but if I'm doing this for too long, you can just call out and don't mind me. Um, and also, I welcome questions as we go. We have an hour and a half, which is not a whole lot of time, um, but I also don't want to just kind of run through something if you're, not, if, if you're not feeling clear about it. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. And I guess I'm not going to hand the mic out, so you'll just have to speak up. So, um, so as you can see on the slide, what it says is we sat side by side in the morning light and looked out at the future together, which I'm presuming most of your parents here, which is why you came. Um, and what this whole thing is going to be about is essentially trying to get back to the essence of that. And um, while, I, while I've been thinking for like how, how I was gonna start this to talk about what I was gonna be doing, and then I got a marvelous quote from uh, the mom of one of the kids I do therapy with, if I can find it here. So she asked him, so like, what, going to bed, is that helpful? Like, what, is, what actually happens? Like, what do you do? And he said, I don't know, I don't know what about going to bed that teaches me other than it just calms me down. He explained why I have big freakouts and how to tell when it's going to happen and what to do about it when it does happen. If I'm mad, I think, what did Ben teach me to do? And then I go and do things that reduce my stress so that I can reach out instead of act out. So, I don't think I could have said it better. <laughs> so, um, parenting is not very easy, as some of you may have found. Um, from time to time, it can get difficult. And I wanted to start with this quote um, from Ron Doss. And I think it'd be really easy to just put parenting in there, which is that um, service is an endless series of questions in which we encounter our own limitations. Does that ring true to anybody? Woo! <laughs> so we're gonna talk about that, like our own limitations and also what, where our kids' limitations are and what, why. Like why, why do we reach these places where there are limitations and we don't know what to do? Um, since we all read the manual on, on parenting, and it didn't, it didn't cover these one or two things. Um, so, no pressure on me, but tonight in an hour and a half, we're going to learn, I hope, what the science of child development, physiology, and the brain, physiology and the brain kind of being the same thing, but I'm going to differentiate a little bit between brain and body tonight. Uh, tells us about why kids and all of us act the way we do. So that's the first thing you should be expecting you're gonna learn for the money that you paid. Okay. Um, number two is what we can do, meaning us, about challenging behavior, both to make it stop in the moment and then also how to pre prevent it in the future, which are two, two different things, obviously, because we like to put out the fires, that's really fun, but it's sometimes nice when we don't have to think that the fire's gonna be going on in five minutes after we put it out. And then lastly, um, one of the cool things about the, the uh, model that I use is that inherent in working with behavior is about building relationship with your kids. Um, and so we're gonna talk specifically about some, some things that we know about attachment and science and ways to be with kids, and in fact, the secret is ways to be with lots of other people too, that can help you build relationship with them. So we've got an hour and a half, and I'm gonna take a little break real quick. Um, because this is body-based work, I want love everybody who feels like it to stand up for a moment. And the cool thing about this is if you don't stand up and you just witness it, you're probably gonna get some positive effects from it. How many folks out here have heard of um, power posing? Anybody? Okay, good. So some of you are already experts, so we're gonna do power posing. Nice and slow. So just 
stand as comfortably as you can. You just pretend there's nobody else in the room. And one arm goes out, and the other arm goes out. And I'm going to count. You guys can't rest through this. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Now, arm up. start to feel defended. So what kind of things happen when our body starts to feel stressed inside? Heart rate. Heart starts to go, heart rate goes up. Tense. Tense. Anybody know what cortisol is? What's cortisol? Stress hormone. Stress hormone, right? So power posing, this is one of the brilliant things about it. Guess what the percentage of the drop in cortisol is if you power pose? Close. It's 14%. <laughs> if you do it really, really well, it's 85. But it's a 14% drop in cortisol without having to think your way out of the problem or anything. Your body all of a sudden just feels powerful. So you're kind of tricking the mind to be like, I'm confident. Like if you're, if you're like this, you're undefended. <clears throat> and your body's just going to feel better. So that's one of the little tools that we'll talk about. We have a whole bunch of other ones at the end. Um, but again, this work is really about the body and what happens. So that's one piece of it. What you can do in the present, in terms of the body. So another basic thing about this model, it's strategic self-regulation is the name of the model. And one, one thing that we think about in terms of this model is it's a stage or state model. So. I, I do a lot of work with folks moving across developmental spectrums, working with kids, turning into tweens, turning into teens. And as we know, as kids grow, they hit different developmental markers, where all of a sudden your kid is able to do something he wasn't able to do the day before. And then the next day he forgets what it was that he just did, like helping you with the dishes or things like that. So kids move through developmental markers, but they also, and this goes for the rest of us as well, the body goes through different states, meaning that states change depending on what's going on around us, what our level of stress is, things like that. So as you can see, stage one, or state one, what do you think these folks need over there? Power pose. Power pose might be good, right? 
to calm down. Thanks. That's my son, by the way. He hears he hears he hears about he hears about this stuff all the time. So what happens in this picture of the um, mom? What what do you think the mom would possibly say to the kid here? Something that's going to be helpful? Probably not. Right, it's actually Calvin's mom. So she's probably not going to say anything helpful to him, right? What needs to happen in this situation? Do they need to figure out the problem? They need to regulate. How did you know that? So yeah, they're not going to do much problem solving at this point, right? So this would be a good time, like folks said, power posing would be good, or some other thing to help the body calm down. The next step is when you actually feel calm, that's when our system opens up in terms of being able to relate to people. If you're really angry, it's not the time to give somebody a hug, it's also not the time to tell them what to do or to listen to what to do either. And stage three, which we may talk about some, is about reason, which means that it's more of sort of the thoughtful reasoning for why you're doing things, self-reflective afterwards. Does that make sense? So this is sort of like before there's a problem, while there's a problem but you're calm enough to talk about, and then reflecting back on like, oh, that's what happened, I don't want that to happen again, what are we gonna do differently afterwards? That make sense? So we're gonna to refer to things in terms of state as we talk for the next hour or so. That it's about looking at what kind of state you're in in terms of what you do in terms of an intervention. So sometimes, stuff like this with our kids, right? And then sometimes I know as a parent, no disrespect to you, Lake, sometimes I feel like this. So, what's that? We'll talk later. Um, so we're gonna talk about this moment right here. What happens when you feel like you're all alone, you don't know what to do, and next thing you know, you're gonna be falling somewhere. Does that feel familiar to anybody? At least two people, good. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this gentleman over there on the right, uh, his name is Al Vecchione. He is a psychologist, although he's not licensed, so he's gotten in trouble a couple times for um, being called that. He runs a place, um, runs a couple of agencies actually out in Middlesex. And um, he's been working ever since he was around 20 um, with folks with really, really challenging behaviors, very explosive behaviors. A lot of folks with developmental disabilities. Uh, he started an agency in Middlesex called the Francis Foundation. And when he started the Francis Foundation, what he was trying to do was keep kids from getting sent out of state to institutions. And so he called up DCF, he called up uh, the Agency of Mental Health and um, the Agency of Devel Developmental Services and said, just send me your toughest kids. And he got all the toughest kids in the state to move to Middlesex. And he's been using the model that we're gonna talk about now, tonight, and the change has been extraordinary. And one of the things that Al has done is he's taken pieces from all the different realms of child development and brain studies um, and behaviorism and all this different stuff and brought it together to create what's called strategic self-regulation. And um, one of the things Leah is gonna have a hand sign out and one of the things that you guys will be able to get if you're interested is I can email you a bibliography, um, which is the stuff that Al has based a lot of his work on. So this is one of the things that he's worked on, which is the Guide to Strategic Self-Regulation Therapy. And I asked him for a quote this morning while I was sitting in Red Hat and freaking out about doing this presentation. And he was helping me regulate because he's really good at that. Um, and this is what he said. The body, again, in here, is where all experience is stored. Meaning what? Everything that's happened to us we can think about it in terms of memory, but the body is the place where all this stuff is really held. On a cellular level, the body remembers pretty much everything. The brain, not so much. Um, so what you see today, so it's where the experience is stored and it's also the springboard for all behavior, meaning we respond to what's going on based on what our experiences are and what's stored in our body. 
So what you see today, in terms of behavior with folks, is based on the experience that people have had and how they've learned to react when they're in distress. So I'm gonna give an example of, obviously a lot of what we do as parents rubs off on kids. Our kids are often like us, for better, for worse. And so here's a little clip that I thought would be helpful in terms of thinking about modeling for children. So what this little girl is learning about communication may work really well at the dinner table with her grandmother, but my guess is like the first day of Mrs. Whalen's class in kindergarten, and maybe a little more tricky, you know, in terms of her communication style. So strategic self-regulation therapy, which I have behavioral in quotes, because I, I go to a lot of meetings as a consultant where people talk, they, they talk about an issue in terms of whether it's behavioral, or whether it's psychological. And what I think is that these two things are really hard to pull apart. So behavior from this perspective is driven by body states and experience, essentially. So we're gonna talk about what strategic self-regulation therapy is, basically, and then we're gonna get into a little bit of the science, and then I, am, I promise you there are gonna be some tools you get to leave with, too. Um, so the first one is that when we see behavior as, as people responding to behavior, what we're really responding to is stress. Somebody's acting in a certain way, acting out, and we'll talk about that, because they're feeling stress, and we're responding to them based on our level of stress, the level of distress that we feel in that moment. And the stress is inevitably caused by these, I think, if you think about it. It's very simple in some way. Things that cause stress are a problem. So you have something and you can't really figure it out. Like we talked about, cortisol level goes up, heart rate starts to go up, all these things start to happen as soon as you're uncertain about what to do. Um, a problem, a threat, whether real or imagined, actual danger, obviously, is gonna trigger a stress response, and then discomfort. So just feeling uncomfortable. Something in your body doesn't feel good, that's gonna increase your level of distress, which is gonna state, change the state of your body. And all of these things can be real, meaning actually happening right now, or imagined, which I mean, it's not just fantasy necessarily, but it, it can certainly just even be in your head. So it may not be a problem right now, but it could be the fact that, you know, taxes are due next week and you haven't paid them for three years. Not that I know anything about that. Uh, the next thing is, um, the response to the stress is the thing that leads to, if not dealt with well, it leads to two different kinds of behavior, which is either explosive or avoidant. So just, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more as we go. But if you're distressed and you can't soothe yourself, your behavior is going to be either avoidant or explosive. I'm not going to explode, I promise. Or I'm not going to go avoidant either, although I, I was thinking about it around 5.30. Um, the next thing to think about is that we have two targets of treatment, meaning there are two things that we can do that are gonna help with the distress. Or not two things we can do, but there are two targets of the distress. One is the brain, and the other is the body. And as we talked about earlier in terms of the stages with one and two and three, you don't wanna target the brain if what's going on in terms of distress is really being driven by the body. So if you start talking to somebody about something when they're distressed and their body physiologically is not calming down, what's gonna happen? 
probably not going to solve the problem. So, <clears throat> when we think of, do folks know what ABC is in terms of behavior? Antecedent behavior consequence, it's sort of a basic way of thinking about it, which makes a lot of sense, right? Something happens, and the antecedent, there's a trigger. We behave because this thing has happened, and because of what we're doing, because of the behavior, there's a consequence, which makes a lot of sense, right? It's very simple. But what this model does <clears throat> is think about, once there's an antecedent, something that triggers, it's not the behavior that starts, what changes first is the body. The body state changes. The body state is what leads to the change in behavior. Does that make sense? The distinction of those two things? So you can focus on the behavior, or you can think, huh, I wonder what's going on in the body that's driving the behavior. <clears throat> so you know if your kid comes home from school on the right, or your kid comes home from school on the left, you're probably gonna have a different couple of hours, <laughs> right? And you can tell that right away. You don't even know what's going on, but you can see it. So we'll talk about what do you do to respond to this right here. So I'm gonna start, we talk about the brain and the body. I'm gonna talk about the brain first. Everybody okay, the pace, good? I'm not going too fast, everything's groovy, okay. So, this is one of the things that Al, Al Vecchione told me that has just really changed the way I think about everything. Um, in terms of my day-to-day -day existence, which is the brain is essentially, it's an anticipation machine. Meaning that what your brain does is it anticipates what's gonna happen, right? It's like a predictive machine. It's always thinking about, well, what's about to happen? You know, all you guys walked into the auditorium and I'm thinking, okay, is it gonna fill up? Is it not gonna fill up? We're always anticipating what's gonna happen and at a basic level, that's really all the brain that's the brain's job, is to anticipate. So what does it base its anticipation on? How does it know what's gonna happen? Past experience. Past ex that's, the only, that's the only thing it has, is past experience, to anticipate what's gonna happen next, right? I mean, if you think about it, there's no, way, there's no way to know what's gonna happen until you've experienced it before. Which unfortunately is really limited because the only experience you've had is your own, right? And that's so your prediction of what life's going to be like is based on all, only what you've, what you've anticipated. You know, if you've lived the life of Axl Rose, as Dan will know, your anticipation of what's going to be happening tomorrow is probably a lot different than mine is. <laughs> and then the brain decides, based on what it's anticipating, it, prepare, it decides and prepares for what it believes is coming next. So instead of being just open in the moment, we're always thinking about what's happening next. Most of this is very unconscious. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is, it, is that like projection? You know, how is that different from projecting? What do you mean by projecting? Like, what, if I'm projecting onto someone, it's like the same thing. It feels like the same thing as that. I don't know. A lot of people might not know what you mean by projection, though. Like. That's a really good point, though. Because when you, when you meet somebody, they're, they're preparing for their experience yeah, of what you're going right. to do. Yeah, well, yeah. right, and that's like, to me, I guess maybe, maybe, I can, maybe I answered my own thing, maybe it is the same to me, because mm. I feel this is the same thing that happens to me when I'm projecting. Like, I'm projecting, so because of that projection, which is related to my trauma and my past experience, mm -hmm. then I, that's how I'm anticipating. Sure, so if we meet somebody, we usually have some opinion on them based on how threatening they are, which is going to be unconscious. You know, all of you, I can look at you and I have an opinion. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Guess what it's based on? My previous experience. It has nothing to do with who you actually are. And unfortunately, especially in our culture, we don't come up to somebody and say, like, I'm an open slate. I just want to know everything about you. Like, can you just be with me, present for a little while? Let's breathe. <laughs> Let's talk about our fears. Let's talk, you know. No, we like meet and we're like, hey, what's up? And you know, like next thing you know, like, I don't know. I've known this gentleman for 25 years, Pat, 
We just drove down to New York. I found out so much more about him, and that's part of that is like I'm not just projecting onto him. I'm like curious about what he's like, you know. So thanks for allowing me to do that. Thanks for allowing me to project on you too for a long time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, 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 does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's how we survive. We anticipate it's what's going to happen. It's not a bad thing, right? We can't start each day new, but we also, if you've had bad experiences. If you've had a really hard time in first grade, your body's anticipation of what second grade is going to be like is probably not like, I can't wait for the first day of school. Right? Right, Eli? Okay. <laughs> Think about it a little bit. So, the brain is also, I'm going to be really like super, super basic science because the brain is obviously more complicated than this. But we think about the brain in terms of this model simply, which is that there are two parts of the brain. There's the frontal lobes, and there's the limbic system. And they work in perfect harmony, just like this picture. <laughs> so our system, the body, is controlled by these parts of the brain in terms of the anticipation of what it's going to do. So the limbic system back here, that big lightning bolt, that is all about our survival. The limbic system is what drives our survival, meaning the brain's job, it's an anticipation machine, but I also thought of the brain, the only job the brain really has is to make sure that this thing stays alive and maybe lives as good a life as it can, but more importantly, that it survives. Like, that's the most basic thing. So, what this thing is doing all the time is assessing threat, and it drives the behaviors when high stress happens of explosion avoidance, and shut down, which we'll talk a little bit more about. The frontal lobe, which is also awesome, only limited by its previous experience, controls up here, this part of the brain, controls stopping. So even just the impulse control is controlled by the frontal, with the frontal lobe, okay? It also is where you think and where you process. How you solve problems is through the frontal lobe. And it's also the place where memory starts to work. So memory is based, there, there are mechanisms in the frontal lobe that take in information and hold it so you'll be able to use it at, at another time. Which one of these works faster? The limbic system is about, works at about twice the speed of the frontal lobe, meaning it's, it's processing information much more quickly and it's not paying that much attention to this. In fact, what's the more important part of your brain in terms of survival? The lightning one, the lightning brain, the limbic system. So when we start to feel a high enough level of distress, the limbic system starts to get activated, and what happens to the frontal lobes? They start to shut down, and if they start to shut down, what happens to the job they're doing? They don't do it very well, right? So <clears throat> what happens when we go limbic, and this could be subtle, it doesn't have to be dramatic, it doesn't have to be like there's a lion in the room, our limbic system starts to turn off, okay? And so then what happens to our thinking? Do we stop thinking? No, but what happens often when our limbic system is going and our frontal lobe shut down is this. Because <laughs> the brain's still figuring it out, but meanwhile this thing's like, not, not gonna, not, this, there's not a whole lot of activity going on up there. <clears throat> so one of the things that can happen then is a word that I love, called confabulation, which is the brain thinking, the brain's continuing to think, and it's thinking and knows what's going on, but really everything's being driven by fight or flight, so everything's being evaluated for threat, and so you start to have crazy ideas of why you're doing things, <laughs> because this part isn't really working. Yeah, Leah? Can you give an example of what that would look like in, say, like a 10-year-old or a 11-year-old boy? I bet you can. <laughs> Um, why are you thinking of us? Can you I, can you think of an example of this? Oh no, I I wouldn't know anything. You wouldn't know anything. <laughs> but I think it, it might be helpful to hear like a concrete example of a ten or eleven year old boy. I don't know anything. I don't know anything about ten or eleven year old boys. <laughs> um. Well, confabulation is. <sighs> Wait. Can you think of a good example? Mm -hmm. 
Right, so you have, yeah. Well, I was saying that, that my 10-year-old son does sometimes, and he's like, you know, if, if there's some sort of criticism of his behavior, you know, or like if something goes wrong, mm -hmm. he like, will immediately jump to, oh, what well, horrible person has ever made a hit to me. That's a great example. Right, right. That's a great example of confabulation. The reason this is happening is because I'm horrible. Yeah. No, the reason that you're happening is because you were doing something and didn't put that away. Yeah. Right. That's a real. That's a great example. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Okay. You. Does your kid ever do that? No. <laughs> All right. So that's the brain. That's that's the whole entire semester on the brain. <laughs> Any questions? Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Good. So we went from the brain and now we're gonna go, this is my favorite part. Cause the brain is like kind of boring. It's not very smart. Like it doesn't really know that much. All it knows is what it's already experienced. And then it thinks it has everything figured out. You know, especially if you're like 19 or 20. Um, so we're gonna get back to this guy, the body. So <clears throat> one of the most beautiful things about strategic self-regulation therapy is it talks about these two systems that are inborn. Everybody know who that is? Yeah, okay. So, what's he doing over there? He's boxing, he's defending himself, right? He's ready. And what's he doing over there? Facing his child? Yeah. So, he's not, he's not defending anything. I guarantee you if somebody walked in the room and tried to mess with his kid, he'd be defending, he'd go back to defense mode. But these are the two modes. One of them is like this, and one of them is not just not just not defending, but is actually socially open, is engaged, it's social engagement when we're not feeling distressed. Does that make sense? Okay, ready to be convinced of that? Okay. So, <clears throat> we think of this, the defense response, right? Muhammad Ali like this. In this model, there's three responses when we get distressed. So remember we talked about distress and what triggers distress, the four things? Anyone? What are things that make us feel distressed? Threat, Threat problem, danger, and discomfort, right? So the moment you start to feel these things, your defensive system will trigger. Cortisol level may go up a little bit, your heart rate may go up a little bit, your breathing may go up a little bit. That stuff just happens in your body. Your body's like, I'm ready to fight the tiger, or I'm ready to get the heck out, okay? So, <clears throat> what we know about the distress response system is that there's two main things. Acting out, which is hyper arousal, which is that's when your limbic system is gonna either, it's gonna, by any means necessary, avoid the problem or defeat, defeat the problem. And then if it doesn't do fight flight, what it does is it checks out, meaning it goes avoidant. So it can't defeat the thing, it can't, it can't, it can't actually escape, so it's just gonna start, start to shut down, okay? Does that make sense? So the third defensive response is this one over here, which is reaching out. So if you think of a little baby, what does it do when it's distressed? Which is what? It's reaching out. It's communicating its behavior, it needs something, and if you're a good parent and have actually gotten some sleep and you're like feeling all right, you're gonna be able to respond to that baby in a really appropriate way. There's this guy, anybody heard of Daniel Stern? He's a psychologist, not the actor, but he, he studied infants. He did psychotherapy on infants. And what he studied was that a baby needs a response, a, a baby's behavior looks for a response. What's your guess, how often? What's that? <laughs> Any guesses as to how often a baby is looking for a response? Every 75 seconds. So in order to be a really good parent, all you have to do is respond to your kid every 75 seconds from the moment it's born. And then you're not gonna have any attachment issues, no behavior issues, anything like that. So what starts to happen when the mom or the dad or the cousin or whoever is not responding in those 75 seconds is the, the, the baby starting to evaluate you know, whether it's okay and successful to reach out, which most of the time it is for folks, unless they've had pretty horrific childhoods. And if not, they're gonna start going into some kind of hyper arousal response or, or a response of checking out. So, 
we talked about this, this gets triggered by the problem, threat, danger, discomfort, and then typically what happens is fight, flight, or checking out is gonna to lead to what we call bad behavior. So when I talk about strategic self-regulation, we think of all behavior is really just one of these two things. Either we're responding to distress by an action of confrontation, or we're disengaging. So this is too much, I'm just not gonna do it. I'm not gonna show up, something like that. And so what we're really wanting to think about is how, how do we enable people to do what when they're distressed? How do we enable, what do we want our kids to do? If they can, we want, we want to help them with reaching out. Now unfortunately, there's all sorts of problems that can arise with reaching out, otherwise we would do it all the time. And we may get to that by eight o'clock. So if we're in this situation right now, the body's feeling what, probably? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable and some level of scare, right? But what do we know that's going on with the frontal lobes? Shutting down. So really, this is what we're thinking. Like, our, but for the most part, unless, I mean, there are situations where obviously there's something to be really scared of, but I would guess most of us live lives where 99% of the time where we're triggered by distress, it's not, it's not a dramatic thing that our body really needs to respond to in terms of complete acting out or checking out. Make sense? So, reaching out for the most part is good behavior. So if a kid is stressed at school, you hope that they can talk to the teacher about what's going on and resolve the problem. And otherwise, they're probably gonna act out or not, or, or check out. So that's the defensive system, is that clear? Any questions about that? Okay. So we talked about the defensive system, and what was the other one? What? Advancement. So there's, there's defense and then there's advancement. So advancement is all about safety. If you feel okay and safe enough, your body is, we're, we're designed as creatures to move out in the world unless there's you know, a tiger over there. We're designed to actually move out and do things and explore. <clears throat> and so the advancement system is all about opportunity and what's next. And the really cool thing in terms of bad behavior, quote unquote, is that the advancement system actually turns down the defensive system. So I think of it as like two, like on old stereos, I don't know, we don't, we don't have these very much, but basically there are two dials that are kind of moving and fluctuating all the time. One is defensive and the other is advancement. And so the way they work is, this is funny, I don't, I'm not sure I'm supposed to do this with one hand. As the defensive system turns up, the advancement system will turn down, right? So that's not great. So one way of turning down the defensive system is to do what? Turn on the advancement system. And there are specific aspects of the advancement system. And if you can, if you can get to these, you're gonna turn down the defensive system without even calling attention to the behavior. So those are, one of them is just basic regulation. If you turn down the distress level of the what? The body, you're shutting down the defensive response. Make sense? Yeah. So the other ones are all really cool because what you're doing, you're gonna engage the advancement system and play is a big part of that. Exploration, we're naturally designed as creatures to go out and explore, otherwise we would have never left our huts, right? But the only reason we left our huts is because we needed something that was out there. Um, caretaking is a big one. The, if you're taking care of something else, your defensive response is gonna turn down. Why is that critical for human beings? For those of you who have pet babies who are up at three or four o'clock in the morning, the only thing that helped you all survive was the fact that your caretaking system would turn down your defensive response. I also wanna say, all the slides I can send out too. I didn't wanna print them up beforehand, but we're gonna have um, a sign-up list and if you give me your email, I'll send out the slides along with the bibliography. What's up? Okay, so for, if you haven't seen that, that's gonna go out too, because I know this is kind of a lot, a lot of information. So, any questions? 
All right, do I still have your advancement attention? Okay, good. So <clears throat> this is it in a nutshell in terms of defensive response. Something happens in the world or internally, we start worrying about something we weren't worrying about two minutes before. And the first thing that happens, antecedent leads to state change. Our physiological arousal will change. That's the next thing that's gonna happen. Based on that, defensive system goes on. We start thinking about stuff to whatever level of accurately or not. And we have these three things that are gonna happen, which is either acting out, which is fight, flight, freeze, the limbic system in terms of its full on rush to, rush to get out of there. Um, reaching out, which is all about safety, seeking out others. And when you seek people out, your limbic system settles enough and you can start to problem solve and think about things. And then the last one is immobilization, which is avoidance. Your body is designed to, if it can't reach out and it can't get out, it's gonna check out. It's gonna avoid. So, what's up? Yeah. No, that's a really good question. Freeze is like, a, sh a freeze is like a deer in the headlights. Like the body actually locks up. It's like a possum. It like plays dead. That's a little bit different. This is actually hypoarousal. It's also called dorsal vagal. It's the body is a different mechanism of shutting down, which is more social disengagement. So freeze is like the deer in the headlights. Checking out is like I open the door and the room is filled with people who I don't know and I'm not so sure I want to go in. So that's a really good question. Thanks for asking that. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Yes, Rebecca. Um, just thinking about that, there's this visual in your system when I see the zones and regulation. Mm -hmm. Do you ever work with teachers or families about, because that's totally a lot in my classroom, uh -huh. and uh, you know, with our social thinking? Yep. Is there a way of collaborating to overlap this model with the zones and regulation? Probably. I mean, when I can show you some of the tools that we use are about exploring what your body feels like and when. I mean, I can show you a couple of them because I think they're, it's, it's a good question. One of the things that we talk about is like, look, it's self-regulation, right? So you want to be able to know what's going on internally. And so I'm not sure if this is, I think this is probably similar, but it's essentially what it feels like in here, what people see. Yeah, and then also what I can do and also what other people can do to help me. So, thanks for the question. Does that answer it? Huh? Let's do it. All right, so from here, anybody have any idea what the treatment zone part of this is? Great. Yeah, it's places where things are starting to go funky, but you can actually do something about it. When first somebody's running down, when someone's about to hit you in the face, they're already they're already in full fight flight mode. But there may be ways to do something before that, when you start to get stressed, or before you do something really awful. If you've gone and done something really awful that you're going to regret later, you're not in the treatment zone. You've stepped out of the treatment zone. The treatment zone is the place where you can feel awful or distressed and do something about it. Right, Wake? Yeah. So another way, <coughs> this is sort of the big picture of strategic self-regulation. So on the top we have a acting out, which is hyperarousal. The feelings that are associated with that are what? It, good. How did you know that? So fear angry leads you to fight flight, right? Checking out is a little bit more, um, I don't know if nefarious is the right word. We tend to look at acting out behavior, like kids acting out as being bad. But one of the things that's a real struggle is hypoarousal are feelings that can be a lot more dense in terms of checking out. Where you start to feel sort of like what you said with your son is like, I'm so awful. 
Like there's a way that that's acting out, but it's also checking it out. He's like, oh. And that's going into places of guilt and shame, hopelessness and helplessness. So if that behavior is fight or flight, this is about avoidant, disengagement, numbing. In fact, I would suggest, or maybe argue, I don't know if I want to argue about it, but I would suggest based on the years that I've been doing therapy, that really mental, mental illness, mental health is all about, mostly about hypoarousal. You have some issues where hyperarousal is an issue with violence, certainly. I don't want to diminish that. But things like depression, all of that goes under the hypoarousal. Your body's just disengaging and it's misperceiving what's going on in terms of reality. So what we're looking for is reaching out in safety. And when I have here feelings, the authentic ones, what do you think I mean by that? Right, they're not responses to, right? So we talk about safety and we want it to be all about feeling good, but actually the authentic self is that feeling place that's not necessarily reacting to something else, but is feeling something coming up from inside, which can be joy, sadness, pain, fear that you're just feeling that's not based on that. And so the hope is that you, if you can feel those things, you're not gonna react as much. You probably will to some degree, but most of, most of fight, flight, and hypoarousal, I think is actually avoidance of those more authentic feelings. Seem reasonable? Okay. So it's not just about feeling good, it's about feeling what's actually happening without having to react to it. So we call that the authentic self, which I know is sort of like a, a catch phrase or something that we're, we're talking about it sounds like a little, for me, a little like a little new agey. But when I think of the authentic self, I think of this is the place when we're regulated. Like we're reaching out, we're socially engaged and we feel good. That's, most people do pretty well when their distress level is high. And I think the reason is we're not going into hyperarousal or hypoarousal. Sound good? Yeah. So, you know how I talked about the stage model? I mean, the state, like we can, we move through these different states throughout the day. This is also a stage model in terms of emotional growth and health, which is that as you move from left to right, as you can see, hyperarousal and hypoarousal will decrease. So if you think of a child developmentally, that's part of what happens as you go from left to right. And the more, the bigger the green gets, and the bigger the treatment zone gets, which means the ability to tolerate distress, the more you're able to be in the world in a way where you're not just reacting. Okay. And then there's the day to day, which is, this is what it's really about, which is that we're all, from moment to moment, moving through this. Our body is constantly in a state of regulating or dysregulating. So you see somebody coming down the street toward you who you adore and you can't wait to see, you know, that, that green may get really strong. You see like somebody who you just talked to yesterday and had a big fight with, your arousal is gonna change. You enter situations where you haven't been successful, what happens to your arousal? It goes up or down. It goes up or down, exactly. You go into situations that you've been really successful in, what happens to your arousal? What? Well, it stays there. It's going to be more, your, your, your regulation is going to stay more steady. And that's, can I say this? Yes, please. And that's connected to the thing before about, you know, what you expect. Right. You know, because you were successful, so you were, there's an assumption that you will be successful again. Or, you know. Right. Nothing, nothing builds hope like success. If you've experienced it before and been able to do really well with it, you're going to be more hopeful about it, right? So you show up to my office for therapy the first time and you're like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to talk to this guy. Check out, check out, check out. After a while, you hope you start to feel better with your life. You're going to be more eager to go. You're going to be more regulated. You're going to be less defended. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, perfect. So how do we do this? How do we help with regulation? 
So the good news is we talked about these things are really good at turning down the level of distress. Okay, and we're gonna talk specifically about the physiological regulation. I'm actually gonna give you all a website that has a bunch of these different things that you can do to help your body regulate. And maybe your kids will wanna do it too, because it's really fun. Um, <clears throat> but these other ones also, if you could bring these to consciousness more, it can be really helpful. Any questions about these, the advancement system things? These turn off our distress. Yes. Um, remember to play? Yep. That means like to um, to like help, um, help regulate and be like play like playing. Playing, <laughs> exactly. If you see kids at play, they're not distressed, right? It only becomes distressing if there is a problem or a conflict or someone starts to lose and they don't have the ego strength to tolerate losing and so they start to get distressed and all those things happen. So, yeah, playing is great. When we play, we're regulated. Okay. What is pair bonding? Pair bonding is like intimate relationships. So, um, I'm not sure what like the real definition of pair bonding is, but what I've discovered pair bonding to be in terms of therapy is people who you can be really vulnerable with. Like so, so boyfriend, girlfriend, child, father, child, mother, 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 child. And really, really close friends. There's a pair bonding, there's an intimacy in terms of the relationship. So people who you inherently feel really, like you know well enough to feel really, really safe with, I would say is pair bonding. As opposed to socialization, you're kind of checking each other out. You know, socialization is like the first date. And if you're regulated enough, like that's helpful, it feels good. Pair bonding is like knowing people really well. That's how I would define it. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. I have one more question. Yeah. What do you, what do you mean by caretaking in this? Because I... It's not the negative caretaking. Caretaking is taken care of. So when you're, when you, you know, like I, I do really well in therapy because I have this cute little white dog named Buttons that when he's there, people are much more regulated. And part of that is because they, 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 he, they feel like they're taking care of him. He just looks at me while he's being picked up by these little kids. It's like, why are you letting these kids do this to me? And I'm like, because I'm turning on their caretaking system. So they're going to be more willing to talk to me. Okay, so advancement system is good, and which is the good of the three of the defensive system that leads to good behavior? Reach out. Reach out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a huge like life hack, cool <laughs> secret for like how to do well with people, okay? Because this is all about how you encourage reaching out. I'm gonna back up a little bit here. If I can. Oh, I don't have it. Okay. Do, 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 do. Where is it? I don't have it. Well, I, I'm missing a slide. Sorry about that. So, with reaching out, the way you build reach out is the same way as you build attachment. So, if you want somebody to reach out to you, and you and you want to find people to reach out to to help you regulate your arousal and problem solve and all that. This we call the big six of attachment. And I'm sorry I don't have a slide that breaks it down a little slow. I know that's, this is like a lot. But in order to reach out or be reached out to, you have to experience safety with the person. Like they have to feel like a safe person to you. Um, so if you are calm and patient with somebody, they're gonna be more likely to reach out to you, right? The next one is generate positive affects. Um, duty to, to delight is a wonderful expression, which is that if you're with somebody and you just enjoy their presence and you're smiling, that is gonna help you be a person who they're gonna reach out to. And it's gonna help them manage their arousal. Um, proximity seeking is welcoming. If you approach somebody and you're not seen as a threat, they're gonna be more likely to welcome you in. And the same goes if you approach somebody and they don't say, whoa, dude, like, hey, 
you know, you're going to be more likely to reach out to them. So that's three on the left. And then we have safety in general, but this one's really cool, which is that if you're actually stressed out and having a hard time, if that person helps you feel soothed, it's also going to increase the, the, the capacity to reach out and your sense of attachment. Make sense? The next one is about communicating, problem solving, negotiation. Just being curious with somebody also helps build that sense of attachment. And the last one is just affiliation. Like if you have shared interest and you want to talk about stuff with people, that's going to make you more likely to reach out to them and them to reach out to you. So how does this relate to parenting? Is it easy to do these things all the time? No. But when is it easy to do these things? When you feel what? When you feel calm, when you feel regulated, these things probably come pretty naturally, right? When you start to feel distressed, it's a little bit hard to have compassion at 9.30 at night when somebody hasn't played the flute and is saying they need to play the flute to, for rehearsal and practice and hasn't done their homework and then is complaining about brushing their teeth. It's a little more tricky to be like, it's okay, sweetie, like everything's fine. Like, don't worry about it. So I know this is like a lot of information. Again, you'll get the slides. This is something that I could spend. Bye, Jim. <laughs> this is something that is like a full day's worth of training, breaking down each one of these things. But th this stuff is wonderful in terms of not being reactive with people, in terms of managing your own distress. So I feel like I'm giving you a secret. I don't know if you feel the same way. So, okay, so we have, we have this, we have the reaching out, right? So a kid's distressed, my son's having a really hard time, he's gonna avoid fight, flight, running away. He doesn't really wanna check out, so he goes to reach out to somebody because those are, there are only three possibilities, right? So what happens, though, this is the question I've gotten a lot, because you wanna teach people to reach out, but what happens if you try to reach out and it didn't work? What the heck do you do? Right? What's up? Well, you could try somebody else, right? Yeah, you can continue to try to reach out for sure. Like somebody, there must be somebody in the universe who understands me. None of the people in the room do, but there's gotta be somebody. But what if you're feeling really, really stressed out, really angry, all of those things, and, and you went up to the woman, and, you know, the woman who was supposed to help you, like, you're, like Eli, you're on the playground, right? You have a problem with another kid, and so you go up to the, the person who's supposed to be helping like, manage all the kids, and they're like, eh, I don't even believe that happened. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll talk to her about it later. So that happens, what are you gonna do? Well, you can act out or check out, but I certainly hope there's another there's another option. Self-regulate. Self you can try to find another teacher, but self-regulate is it, right? So this is the beautiful thing. You're going to be acting out and checking out a lot less if you believe me that it's all based on the body if you are able to regulate, right? So what do we know about ways to regulate? Okay. Anybody else do any things that, reg that regulate them? Meditation. Meditation. Breathing. Yeah. Power, Power pose. pose. Power pose. Exercise. What? Exercise. Exercise. Uh, doing homework. <laughs> <laughs> That's another one. Music. Music. Okay. So luckily, there's plenty of things, and in strategic self-regulation, we have all of these um, tools. And I'm going to give you a link to a website where Al Vecchione actually in person over the internet um, walks through these. And what's really cool about that too is he talks about all of these are science based, these are all research based regulatory tools. So he talks about that, like why these things do this. So one of the great things at the beginning is if you allow and provide an escape 
for somebody when they're distressed, that's really regulated. So I know a lot of folks are like, I've seen situations with parents where they're like, no, we're gonna talk about this right now. I recommend really strongly you don't do that. Going to take an escape allows you to regulate, allows the frontal lobes to come back on, and allows people to come back. I've, I've had a lot of experience working with really, really explosive kids, like kids who are restrained fairly regularly because their behavior is so aggressive. These kids will not reach out because of what, do you think, in terms of their previous experience? What's happened to them in the past? Really severe trauma. Okay, so these are kids who've been abused really badly in their homes, they've had really horrible experiences, they learned really quickly that reaching out was not a safe thing to do. So they're stuck with what? Acting out or checking out. I was working with the kids who would never check out. These were act out kids. Total, total aggression, fight, flight behavior, okay? A lot of programs will not allow that to happen, so what happens? No, they don't check out. These kids will not check out. Their survival is based on I'm never doing that. They get, sent away. they get sent away to where though? And they're still gonna go into fight, fight, flight, right? And they're never allowed to escape, so what happens? They end up getting, they end up getting restrained, you know? So the, um, Stephen Porges is a, is a great name. There's a reference to him. He, he's developed this thing called the polyvagal theory, which is all about the vagus nerve, which is connected to all of these defense systems that we have in the body. He did a study around restraint and what happens to the body when it feels like, when it's in restraint, is if you think about fight flight, and you're not allowed to fight, and you're not allowed to get out, the body literally starts to feel like it's going to die. That's the experience of being restrained. So one of the things that we worked on, and Al, Al has worked with really explosive kids, is you allow them to learn how to escape the situation and get out in order to come back. And that's been a lifesaver for a lot of folks. But it's also a really good thing to do for our kids. Like, I'm, I'm gonna take a break, I'm gonna take an escape, and I'm gonna come back when I feel calm enough to talk to you. Looks like, wait, they're making you escape right now. <laughs> nice timing. Good night, love. Good night. Yeah. Love. Thanks. What's up? Mm -hmm. Right. What you do then is what's more important is how you how you talk about it afterwards. So processing it afterwards. One of the things you can talk about is you can make an escape plan, which is when everybody's calm. Okay. The problem, the, the question was, you're like, okay, I'm gonna, t I'm, I'm realizing I'm getting distressed. The kid, my kid is really upset and angry, so I'm gonna take a break, and the kid follows you. Anybody looks like other people know that, right? So you're doing everything you can to regulate because you don't want to act out on the kid, and you're trying to just take an escape, and they follow you. And so she asked me, well, what do you do there? What I would say is that you want to be able to talk about it when everybody's calm and actually come up with a family escape plan. And then practice it when you're calm. You could be like, remember honey, the other night when you were really upset, I'm gonna take a break, let's practice it. Because another thing that you're working against there is attachment style, which my guess is with your kid, if you leave, what happens to the distress level? It goes up. So what you wanna teach in that moment is I'm gonna leave and you're gonna be okay. And the only way to teach that is to have it, it's not something the frontal lobe is gonna get, but it is something that the body can get. And so if you can work the body with it, not in a moment of distress, but in a moment of like, remember what happened last night, we want to avoid that, you were really upset, I was upset. Sometimes I just need to take a break, let's, let's practice it. I'm gonna go over here, you go over here. Some way to, some way to make an agreement about what's gonna happen. And then practice it when you're not distressed, so in the moment when we're distressed, we're like, remember we talked about this, I'm just gonna go here for a moment. Because then again, the brain's an anticipation machine, right? So you're fighting against the anticipation that your kid may not have any idea what you're doing. 
like if you leave, life is over because the anticipation is I need you when I'm distressed. And so you have to break that, break that form of attachment by talking about it and, and working it through and practicing too. It might take a while. You could be like, okay, now I'm gonna do that. When your kid gets really distressed, I'm gonna do that thing, I'm gonna leave. And they may be like, no! And you're like, oh, all right, well, it's not gonna work this time. But I guarantee you, if you work it through and talk it through, then it'll get easier and easier. Yeah. So, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you say, okay, we're going to take a break. Mm -hmm. And so we're all in the stress, calm down, and right Yep. And then the kid continues to basically be upset, and there is no way to try to. So then if you try to do like a timeout or put them sort of in their room, right, then that's your, you're leaving them, right? So then their stress is going to go up. Right. Because they feel like you're abandoning them when they're upset. Mm -hmm. So how are you supposed to, like, how do you deal with that? In that moment? Yeah. In that moment, it's really hard. The way you deal with it is, is try, is working on some of these things while you're not distressful, while you're not distressed. You go back home and you're like, honey, like that was really hard. I went to this great training and I learned these really cool things that we're gonna try so you're not so distressed. And these things can be really helpful. Um, but in the moment, I mean, you're dealing with total limbic system fight flight response. If you try to disengage or do something that's unplanned, that hasn't been rehearsed and practiced in the body, there's not a whole lot you can do other than keep walking through and keep trying to change it. So again, I was the um, director of the clinical director of the new school in Montpelier. I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but it's a small private school on the top of the hill for kids with really severe trauma and behavioral challenges. That kind of thing happened all the time. And it sometimes takes a long time to break that. So what I would say is you want to do planning around it, practice this stuff, make the, the more you can make this sort of part of your family culture stuff that's, that feels good and comfortable and not hokey, and, you know, don't do power posing if it feels really hokey. But there's a lot of things to try. Um, and then I think teaching the escape outside of the context of how awful it is. You're gonna be, it's like you're ready, your body's gonna be ready for it and be able to anticipate it. I don't have like a magic thing. You guys know one, two, three magic? You ever heard of that program? Basically the idea is you count to, th like you, the kid's acting up and you count to three and by the time you get to three the kid's gonna stop, right? <laughs> it actually works, it really does. It's a very powerful program. Why do you think that works? What's that? Huh? Well, think about it from the model that we've been talking about, if you buy what I'm talking about, about distress. Does counting to three, you think, if counting to three is threat-based, what's gonna happen with the distress? It's probably gonna go up. So something else is, come, is happening when you're counting to three. Pat? No, practice is in prison, right? You've all heard it. One, two, three? Yeah. Well, no, that's what it is. I'm going to count to three, and you're going to stop. It's it's inherently calming. You're like, you know, if you think about it, the frontal lobes, a part of it is impulse control. You're creating the space for stopping. You're creating the space for impulse control. And so kids who can self-regulate, by the time you've counted to three, they've sort of created some impulse control, or you've created impulse control. And I have to say, as somebody who's worked with really challenging kids and does a lot of stuff about behavior, there's nothing more, it's not funny, but there's nothing funnier to me than seeing a parent do one, two, three and having it not work when that's their only tool. Like that, I just, I have to, I get amused, but I, I, I have my own sort of sense of humor around it. But even that, like you can just be like, well, you know, if you, if you bring that to, because I don't think our kids want to act out. I don't think any of us really want to act out. It's always that there's this feeling of distress or something feels unresolvable. So if you bring it to the moment and you talk about it, our kids can often have really good ideas of what they actually need when they think about it. But then you gotta practice. You can't show up at the game with like a minute left and try to shoot free throws all of a sudden. You gotta, it has to be part of that cellular muscle memory. Again, so the brain's anticipation is like, 
Oh, right, last time I got this upset, we resolved the problem. As opposed to last time I got this upset, mom, mom walked out. And then I don't want her to do that again. And then you're, you're, you as a parent are trying to do the right thing, but the distress level is just going up. Yeah, Heidi. Can we talk for a minute about the different conversations that you would have practicing this with a teenager versus an elementary student? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think um, I what. Feel like Yeah. The response is not going to be positive. Right. So I think one way to frame it for an 11 or 12 year old is that I think 11 or 12 year olds don't want to feel distress. Right? But often do. They often do, for sure. But if you think about it, there are ways that we can resolve this that are going to feel, that are going to help you feel better. Framing it as that, instead of saying, I have this wonderful thing, power posing. I mean, I'll show you the website. You can explore different ones. You can be like, this is why it works. Here's the science behind it. You know, just to just, like I had you guys all do up and do power posing. I'm sure if I did that in the middle school, none of the kids are going to do it, you know? But if you talk with them about the science of it, they may be more interested in it. And there's a lot of different things to do. You know, taking an escape is not hokey. And if you understand why you're doing it, it's not because you're being punished, it's because everyone's stressed out here. We want to reduce the level of stress. We're, we all feel better. That may start to work. And it may not work right away, but over time, you're changing some patterns that are also have been there for a while. Well, so. a power pose could be hokey to a, a teenager, but like skateboarding or something, or whatever. Right. Whatever their power pose is. Right. Yeah. Okay. What's that? Or push-ups. Do you say that to your kids? Drop, drop it to the attack. But they'll also remove themselves from where they are and they'll flash their hands and they'll have to do it in front of other people and they if they understand what's going on in their body, they don't think how this is gonna help, they're more likely to go and Right. I mean, part, part of what's challenging about, when, you're, when your distress level is up, you're defending yourself, not necessarily from the tiger and the threat, excuse me, you're defending yourself from feeling vulnerable. And what these things do, the reason it's hokey, is because I think it, it feels vulnerable. It feels vulnerable to power pose in front of all you guys who I don't know. But that's kind of inherent in it, is that we want to get back to our authentic self, which is actually vulnerable. It's not defended. But man, human beings have a really hard time with that. It's really hard to just feel something. We're not, we don't engage in that very often. And so hokey to me is just another, you know, your defense is on. Your defense is on about the very thing that, you're, that, that would help you with your defenses. Which is fine, because you can't go right at the defense, as we know, you have to go around it. Yeah. Right. Well, so, if you ask somebody to do something, like here's the thing: if you're asking somebody to do something when they're already distressed, and you haven't practiced it before, and even though you know it's going to work for sure, their frontal lobes are not going to take in the information as this is helpful. It's going to feel like a threat. Right? We don't process information. I mean, it's the reason why like, everybody argues about everything all the time is because information only works if it's going through the frontal lobe. Most information is taken in through the limbic system, which we're defending ourselves against. Right. Well, I think part of it is, part of it is starting to understand the physiology behind it. You know, so if you understand that you're, what you're doing is a defensive distress response and it feels better to not feel that way, right? Like you have wonderful moments with your 12 year old, I'm sure. And you could say, this is our authentic self, we feel really good, or whatever word that isn't gonna feel hokey. We could have more of this. 
And what's happening for you here is that your, your, your defense response is, is going up. And so some sort of psychoeducation around it can be helpful. You know, you can blame it all on me. I saw this guy, like, I think he was an idiot, but we could try this. You know, like, like that kind of thing. Like, I think we all want to do well. We all want to be in authentic selves. We're just not aware that we're in a defensive reaction a lot of the time. So, yep. Um, I have a question about this Yeah, please. Oh, sorry. She's asking a question from a classroom perspective. It's sort of like the thermometer. Like, where are you actually on the thermometer? You know, if you're up here, I'm not going to be able to get you to do your math work. But are you just avoiding? Is this checking out rather than regulating? And that's, it is a hard one. You know, it's a hard one because inherently you want to turn on the motivation system to get them to do work themselves without you having to be the one who's getting them to do work, which is also really hard. That's another training that I'll do another time. But that's a piece of it. And a lot of times folks will say, you know, well, they're avoiding. They're, they're not stressed, they're just avoiding. You know, they don't want to do their homework. The, the framework for me is that that's still a distress response. They're not avoiding work, they're avoiding distress. The distress just happens to be the work. And so helping them tolerate the work is part of it. So when you think of stage one versus stage two versus stage three, a lot of your kids are stage one, meaning that they just are distressed, right? And so it's not until they go into stage two that you can sort of problem solve and reason with them a little bit. And you may be able to have a moment where like, I notice that this work is really hard and you get stressed and want to leave. How about doing one more? How about doing two more and seeing how that feels in your body? Because ultimately when we do things well, it feels good too. And framing that can be part of it as well. But we can talk more about that on Monday when I see you in school. Um, any other questions? Yeah. I think so, I'm not sure. to walk away means that what do they think is going to happen to them? They're, your body's ready to be followed. Like your body, to disengage from a threat means you actually have to feel safe. And so backing away from a confrontation can feel really unsafe. Also from the parent's perspective, a couple people have said it from the other direction. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that without triggering them, then you're going to start, start, going to start to work. Right. 
but if his, I'm not sure if this is the point you're making. If you give them a suggestion and they don't do it, there's no vulner, like they don't, they're not vulnerable enough to respond to it. Right. But sometimes you need to be, as a parent, the vulnerable one to not give a suggestion. Just say, I need to hear some data because I know that I'm not Yeah, I mean, ultimately, us, we're going to model the behavior that we want. The kids are going to do what we do. And the more we can model doing things that are not authoritarian, like the more they're going to become self-regulated. The more authoritarian they are, we are, a lot of people check out, which doesn't really help. It's not a helpful thing either. So, um, I think I'm gonna. I mean, it's almost eight o'clock. Yeah. Sorry, say that again. What about situations where the explosive outbursts correlate with the sudden and unexpected death of the family? Meaning that someone passed away and then all of a sudden there's a lot of outbursts and all that? You know, compassion. Like, I mean, part of how we, how, part of how we tolerate distress is through act out. There's nothing more distressing in that, than that. Or there are a few things more distressing than the sudden loss of somebody. Do you, is that does that make sense? Like, yeah. I mean, it's very hard, right? So, so everything that can be done to help in terms of managing distress, like therapy and engagement in advancement system stuff. I mean, it sounds like it's probably a really tough situation. I'm I'm gonna. I, you can email me. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna. If you sign up, you can ask. That's one thing I'll say is like I welcome people who have questions and follow up. I'm not sure exactly how to do it. I was thinking about maybe thinking about it. if you're interested in like ongoing groups or something related to this, if, it, if it's tickling your fancy, um, thinking about how to how to have some more further conversations about it. But I'm also I'll send out the slides to everybody on the list, and I welcome you guys emailing more, more questions. I welcome the conversation and we'll have all of it. So, um, yeah. I just want to share that um, sometimes I think for me, I, I'm so quick to want to resolve or fix or change something is that I forget that sometimes just that vulnerable feeling they're having is just what they're doing in that present moment. And so sometimes it's uncomfortable to just sit with it and just to be present. And so, if one of my, my boys are upset about something, letting them have that space to be upset about it. Obviously, like if they're, you know, if they're cheerful about it, if they're feeling really angry or stressed out, like just letting them have that space to do that. And I'm not saying like violent throwing chairs or anything like yeah. that, but they might be really upset about something and that's totally valid. But sometimes it's uncomfortable to just sit there and be present Absolutely. and just be quiet and give them that space to do that so that they know how to work through something that's upsetting. Yeah. I mean, one of the most powerful things we can do for our kids is to allow them to have really difficult feelings and know that it's going to be okay. Like, that these feelings are okay. Like, I know from you guys in that way, sort of. Like, the last thing I want is that kid to be terribly in tears and upset. But I also have learned enough to not fix it. I don't know if that's what you're saying. Like, to not fix it, but to just let him be able to feel the feeling. And let it go through him and let it resolve in a way. is really powerful. And it's not something that it's really hard because it's really hard to be vulnerable in that moment when you want to fix it. Yeah. Right, but the the, 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 the the hard thing, and I think this is like a cultural thing, I mean, I could talk about this a lot longer, is that we're so uncomfortable with feeling. That's why I said like the authentic self feels things deeply. We're so uncomfortable with feeling that we react to feeling. So if we're feeling really sad, we're feeling pain, we're feeling these things, we react to it, and then we're going to do one of those two things, which is act out with it, because it feels awful, or we're going to check it instead of just be with it. Because every time we're just with a feeling and actually with it, it resolves. 
It just does. It doesn't, in the moment, it feels like it's going to go on forever. Right? And the best thing we can do with people with high levels of distress is to be able to tolerate it. If we can tolerate the high level of distress and not react to it, that person has a lot of space to just be able to feel what they're feeling. But then it requires us to be able to regulate ourselves in that moment. One of the things I've learned as a therapist that I really, really believe is that we, as people, we experience what other people are experiencing. Like, other people make us feel what their experience is. So, like, I'm working with this girl, really awful trauma history. She decided she thought I was siding with the parents she didn't like, so she does not want to see me anymore for therapy. And it's going out to the school where she works. So what I decided to do, what, what, what her reaction is trying to manifest is an abandonment, which is what she's experienced her whole life. So she's put me over here, and what I don't want to do is just be another person who's abandoned her. So I'm still showing up, and I'm just like, well, I'm here. You know, and she'll go, she, she goes into fight flight, and she's just like, get out of like, get out of here. And I walked into a room where she was with some other clients, and she was just so mean to me, and walked out. And she's like, you better not follow me. I was like, well, what do I do here? And what I realized I wanted to do was sit with the, I felt like, like, I felt, like, awful. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna sit with this and feel this because I'm pretty sure that this is what she's experiencing. And I wanna just be able to sit with that. And that, to me, is also really powerful because I've learned how to regulate myself in that through years and years of experimenting with other people's kids because I've been doing this for 25 years. Like being able to stay with the feeling. I'm glad you brought this up. It's kind of a poignant thing to kind of end with. Because part of it is just being able to be in the feeling of it. And part of that is regulatory. So if you think of this slide, our authentic self isn't happy all the time. It's just having feelings. If you can safely have those feelings, all sorts of growth can happen. We're so used to checking out or acting out with our feelings that we don't want to do it. So, is that helpful? Um, yeah, so what, what's going to happen next is, I know this is like a lot of information. If you want the slides, I'll send them out. And like I said, I welcome any. I'd love to hear feedback around this. Um, I'm happy to do more of these trainings. Like the gentleman from Woodbury was saying, like it'd be great to have more of this in other places. And so if you guys know of other people who might wanna know more about it, um, I'd be happy to, to follow up. So, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Between siblings and parents, but I can't think of a way to distract them from something else. I mean, it's constantly like walking out, just like something like that. Uh huh. So, yeah. so is he ever not? I mean, are there ever moments where he's not distressed? Like that? Moments where, you know, everything's great and wonderful. Right. The rest of the time, it's just Right. Yeah, I mean, that's tough. I think part of it is this, like, with the other person talking about sort of the psychoeducation of why he's doing what he's doing. Like, he probably thinks it's all real, but it's not. It's confabulation. He thinks it's funny. Or that it's Maybe. Oh, that's what he says? Yeah. I doubt that's really true. I mean, I think, again, that's confabulation. He's probably, he may have, I mean, a lot, what, one of the things that's really hard about this is a lot of this can be unconscious. You know, we're just reacting. We have no idea why. I mean, that's part of why therapy is going to be a wonderful thing, is you start to kind of understand why you're reacting and doing these things that you don't want to be doing. You know, but as it's tricky for like tweens and teenagers because they're sort of developing their ego and their persona, and they don't real and they're like, they don't know this. Like, this stuff isn't what we know. We just think that our reactions are real all the time. And so then he has to have an excuse for why he's treating you like crap. My guess is that underneath that, there's something else going on. 
And it may not be something that you as a mom can talk to him about. It may be something that he needs to talk to a counselor or a therapist or something. But I guarantee you the reason he's talking about talking to you that way is because there's some distress that is there that probably has nothing to do with what he's talking about. Right. Well, so, okay, but that, that brings me back to this. I want to share this. And again, this will be on the slides. These are all the things we didn't talk about tonight. Um, so this is a website. Um, that Al Vecchione, again, the guy who's developed this program, just put this website. It's been up for about a week. Um, TamingTheTigerVermont.com. You don't have to put the files in WordPress, so it's just tamingthetigervermont.com will take you to the site. And then each of these, all you do is click on them and there's a video and all sorts of resource material for each one of these. And my hope is that no matter how distressed your kid is, there might be one thing here that they'll do. And that can make all the difference. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like to do it in the schools, you mean? Or I'd love to do that. Yeah. I agree with you completely. I mean, if you can create a buzz to get, I work in a few schools. It's often it's often hard because schools sort of have their behavioral programs that they do. Um, but you can advocate. I'm happy again. If you put your name there, you'll get my contact information, and I'm happy to continue to, to do this. I love this stuff. I mean, I've seen kids' lives change who you who are going to be end up in jail because of this stuff. You know, in terms of the dramaticness of acting out and checking out, but also like, I mean, I can tell you with my son, it works to follow the stuff. It really does. It's not easy, but it's pretty simple in some ways too. So. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.